So welcome to the Morris Federation series of talks and workshops during lockdown. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Wilson and I've got uh, Jenny and Mike Everett helping me today for hosting. And uh, today we've got a talk from Michael Jackson about clogs in Britain and beyond. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael. Thank you, Pauline. I'm uh, speaking here live from Adlington, Lancashire. Um, specifically, if you don't know Adlington, we're a little north of Bolton, which is perhaps a better known place. And uh, also a relevant point is we're perhaps a couple of miles away from Rivington, which I'll mention later on. Um, not in a Morris connection, but a clog connection. I'm going to talk about the origins of clogs in Britain and to relate that story to clogs and wooden shoes from around the world. Um, I might not bother showing the slide, it will come up in a second, but uh, we do like origin stories. We, we don't always know the real facts about how something began. It would be nice to say that we knew who one day looked across to the fire, saw a basket of logs next to it and thought, I could wear those and carved away at them and, and produced something he or she could put his feet into. Um, there isn't necessarily a smoking gun when it comes to the origin of clogs. We, we don't know specifically who, when or where. Um, so we make up stories instead. And, and some of them are perhaps a little bit fanciful. And I'm, I'm going to run through a few slides which discuss um, one of the best known stories about the origin of clogs. And we'll discuss whether it's um, believable or not. So I shall have a stab at swapping to the slides. I'm doing a little quiz but it's rhetorical. You're not going to get any prizes for correct answers. And I don't especially expect you to shout answers at me. But this, this is based on recent research. And these are um, things that have been said in particular about the well-known Flemish weavers who are credited with introducing a number of things to Lancashire um which do you think of these are true they're in, uh, said to have been inspired the creation of lancashire clogs the cotton industry they're said to have introduced jannock bread which apparently became johnny cake in the united states um, i think thanks to wikipedia i learned of the existence of johnny cake the Flemish weavers are said to have introduced some words into the Lancashire dialect, but the only one quoted is Janak. So that probably goes with the Janak bread. Quite often in recipe books and recipes online, it's said that Flemish weavers introduced a poultry dish called Hindle Wakes or Hendela Wake, which um, by pure coincidence has the same name as a play that was first performed in 1912 in Manchester. And then finally, um, they're said to have introduced the whitening of doorsteps, which uh, older ones of you will be familiar with. So I say, which are they uh, credited with introducing? It's said that they introduced all of these to Lancashire. Um, and you might think some of these are a little bit unbelievable. Um, certainly the whitening of doorsteps uh, is slightly unbelievable because donkey stones were only invented in the 19th century. But there you are, it was in a newspaper, so it must be true. Then, if the Flemish weavers came to Lancashire, how did we tempt them here? Um, I've given some perhaps spurious possibilities there. Did we advertise? Did they want to come and exploit the availability of local cotton? Were they fans of Uncle Joe's mint balls? Pies? Or was it the opportunity of mating with the Lancashire witches who were renowned for their beauty? Would you believe that of these reasons for Flemish weavers coming to Lancashire, 
the last one is the one that's actually been repeated more than once in older newspapers. Um, some journalist, possibly after a, a long night in the pub and a, a deadline to meet, genuinely said that the reason the Flemish weavers came to Lancashire was because they wanted to mate with the beautiful Lancashire witches. So that's, that's a bit of a, a curiosity. When do we think the Flemish weavers settled in Lancashire? And, and in particular, it said that they settled in Bolton. Um, I, I've uh, checked what's still said uh, on the web in some cases, and uh, these were dates quoted in old newspapers. We, we've got a range of dates over a 500 year period from Henry II in the 12th century to possibly Charles I in the early 17th century. Um, so the, these Flemish weavers who played such an important part in our lives by inspiring the creation of clogs allegedly came at some point over a 500 year period. Um, and then the most frequently quoted date anywhere, as far as I can find out, is 1337 specifically. Um, if you know Bolton, there is a market cross in Churchgate and there is a plaque on that market cross and it says 1337 Flemish clothiers settled and Wikipedia says it as well so it must be true so we think ah there I am thanks yes the the so-called uh, origin of clogs in Lancashire in particular is said to be uh, the arrival of Flemish weavers at some point over a 500 year period. And this is supposed to have inspired the creation of the clog that we know and love nowadays. The Flemish weave weavers were supposedly uh, in some sources accompanied by other craftsmen. I think it must have occurred to somebody after this had been claimed for quite a long time that weavers were not necessarily the best people for making clogs. Um, so there must have been some other craftsmen with the weavers, with the appropriate tools, who could carve their sabots for them. So allegedly the Flemish weavers came to Lancashire, they were fond of sabots. I'm not quite sure why uh, we say sabots, because if they were Flemish they wouldn't have been speaking French, they'd have been speaking Flemish, but Anyway, all the, all the sources say sabots rather than clompen, which you might have thought. Um, and on the face of it, the theory is that they wore their, their sabots for a very long time, perhaps a few hundred years. Eventually, some Lancastrian thought they didn't look very comfortable and wouldn't be a bit, a bit better with leather uppers. And um, that inspired the creation of the real Lancashire clog. In, in all honesty, it is easy to rebut this um, theory, even though it's, it's long held and you'll find it on the internet if you search today. The, re the reason it didn't happen is that the Flemish weavers didn't come to Lancashire. It's an out and out myth, which was debunked decades ago um, by a Rochdale man called A.P. Wadsworth, who went on to become editor of the Manchester Guardian, um, I think uh, in the 1940s. And he wrote a paper called The Myth of the Flemish Weaver, debunking the idea that they'd come to Lancashire. And um, I'm, I'm sure he's quite correct. I'm still trying to trace that paper, which is a bit difficult in lockdown. But we have identified that the Lancashire Record Office in Preston does have a copy and might just be able to mail me a photocopy at vast expense, um, which is a, a, a follow up, no doubt I'll be uh, quoting from it. So the, the simple way of rebutting the claim that our clogs were inspired by Flemish weavers is that they didn't come to Lancashire when they were said to have done so. Um, we may have seen Belgians settle here many years later, but they probably arrived here at the time that clogs had 
already become, begun to evolve. Now, this, this myth, it has been debunked before. I, I'm by no means the first. And the idea that the, the Flemish introduced the clog, I think it was first, well, the, the earliest person um, to challenge it that I've seen was Julian Pilling in 1967. Um, and, and he referred to it as um, a long held myth. Didn't um, go into any great detail. It was just a paragraph in uh, a paper he wrote on Lancashire clog dancing. Um, but he suggested a, a, a later date for the Lancashire clog uh, of the Industrial Revolution. He, he wasn't quite right in that respect, but it's, it's certainly more accurate than the, the myth that somehow from 1337 onwards, people in Bolton were, were going around the streets wearing um, uh, Sabo or Klompen or, or some sort of European wooden shoe. Um, supposedly one of these uh, one of these wooden shoes actually survived at Rivington, which is why my proximity to Rivington is uh, is relevant. It was repeated um, time and time again in um, books by Edward Baines in the early 19th century, I think through to the late 19th century, that the weavers introduced the clogs and that one of the clogs survived at Inner Cottage in Rivington uh, and then somehow disappeared without a trace. So th there's absolutely no, no physical evidence whatsoever that um, the Flemish were here, wore clogs and inspired um, modern day clogs. Evelyn Vigeon, an author in 1977, took a different approach and she emphasized the, the complex um, way of making solid wooden shoes compared to making clogs. And I'll, I'll swap back to um, sharing the screen. This diagram shows a range of the tools used for producing a pair of sabo. Uh, and some of, some of the illustrations are um, close-ups of the same tools. But um, to produce a, a pair of sabo, you need um, everything from saws and axes to the, the equivalent of, of the clogger's stock knife, which um, Simon Brock demonstrated a few weeks ago. But um, with a stock knife, you, you can get a, a block of wood into a foot shape. But the tricky bit is you need to be able to hollow it out in order to get your foot into that block of wood. And, and this shows a range of the tools that you, uh, you need to hollow out a block of wood. And um, we've got examples of most of these. And I'll, I'll start uh, bringing them to the screen in, in a, a few minutes. I, I've just got a few photographs, uh, old photographs of French and uh, Dutch Sabo and Klompen makers demonstrating um, the process uh, of using these, uh, these tools. So I, I shall show you a few photographs. And th these are a couple of pairs of uh, Sabo makers um, probably in a fair, fairly rural location, making sabo by hand. I mean, of, of the tools used, one that we've definitely not got, you might be able to see on the right of the photograph, a whopping big saw, no doubt for um, chopping tree trunk, trunks into uh, reasonable sized blocks for working with. Um, I think we might struggle to find house room for that one. Uh, plus the post, cost of uh, carriage from France nowadays uh, might be a bit tricky. It would probably end up in a lorry park in Kent for several months. This one of the, the lady shows the process of hollowing out um, a sabo. Uh, you can see that the, they're um, clamped into uh, a, a fairly basic bench and she uses something which you'll see, when you see one up close, you'll see it's a bit like an ice cream scoop for wood. Um, they generally worked with soft wood and uh, unseasoned wood. Make them when the wood's soft and then leave, leave them to season before uh, decorating them and selling them on to the customer. 
but uh, it, it did mean they were often working with softer wood than English clog makers were. And um, a, again, a couple of stages in process uh, of one using um, a different version of the knife and another one of the, the chisels to, to hollow out a sabo. This chap is a, a Dutch Klompen maker. It's um, a similar approach, but rather than the, the ice cream scoop for doing the, the hollowing, he's just got a massive mallet and a chisel, um, which is, a, again, a reasonable approach to that. And this is an example of how the European wooden shoemakers did have an influence that went around the world. This is um, an old photograph from the United States, and it's taken in Holland, Michigan. So Holland, Michigan, I think must have had um, a, a, a Dutch community settled there, and they, they kept up their heritage by having a, a clog center where they made klompen and people wore costume and, and danced around in the klompen. Um, but you can see to the left of his bench, he's got a knife similar to those used by the French. And at the minute, he's hollowing out one of the shoes um, with, with a type of chisel. And, and other tools are visible um, on the bench to his right. So it, it is genuinely a very complicated process to, to make a pair of solid wooden shoes. And Evil Envision's approach to debunking the idea that 14th century Flemish weavers were doing this is it, just, how would they have done it? Um, where did they get the tools from? Where are the tools now? How come none of them have survived? Um, I will show you tools like this, and at some point I'm going to have to put labels on them uh, so that nobody in future thinks they were left here by Flemish weavers. So they came from France, but um, much more recently, no Flemish weavers involved. I, th I think I'll show one more slide before I swap back to uh, full screen. Um, and, and this is a picture of the easy way of doing it all. And, and this is the more typical way it's been done on the continent for generations now. It's a copying lathe, um, a Dutch copying lathe. And though you see uh, an awful lot of Dutch clogs advertised as handmade and hand decorated. Um, people have perhaps brought them back from holidays and so on. For, for, for generations, um, these machines have been available and essentially you just shove a block of wood in and press go and uh, it carves it for you. Um, clean it up a bit afterwards and then apply a transfer and some varnish and there you've got your handmade, hand decorated um, traditional Dutch clog. I think some people might disapprove of that. And I think some of them do it the traditional way, but um, they have used technology for a long time as well. Right, let's see if I can swap back. Ah, ah I'm back, hopefully. Right, I shall. Um, show one of the real knives that um, would be used. Those of you who saw Simon's um, talk will have, have seen him uh, demonstrate the use of English stock knives. Um, this, this is the, the French equivalent and um, they, they were in use in other European countries as well. Um, essentially, it's a little, it's a little bit shorter than a, an English one. The English ones um, are longer and are capable of, of carving harder wood, I would say, than the European ones. Um, as mentioned, the European ones tended to work with softer woods and they would use them usually when they were unseasoned still. 
and, and leave them to season after, after they've done the carving. So um, they, these are a little bit uh, shorter. You, you perhaps don't uh, get quite the, uh, the leverage you do with the English version, but the principles are exactly the same. So um, the basis of carving a wooden shoe is to use one of those. In fact, I, I skipped a stage. I should have started with an ax. They, they get the basic shape of, of the clog um, using these very peculiar axes. I don't think you, you see these uh, for any other purpose. There was one in the diagram I showed earlier on. So it, it is a, an authentic French sabot maker's axe um, for helping to um, get the basic shape of, of the sabot underway. There's another knife, again, th this, is, this is familiar um, to, to people who saw Simon's talk. He, he referred to what English cloggers call a hollower. And this is the, uh, the French equivalent of a hollower. I must admit, I, I'm not 100% certain whether these are much used by sabot makers, but um, as I'll demonstrate shortly, the Europeans also produce clogs exactly equivalent to our own. So they had the same processes to go through um, and they would have used this type of hollower in the same way that Simon uses his. Um, it's a little bit smaller, but uh, as I said, probably using softer wood in many cases. I think we'll have the corkscrew. Here's some we prepared earlier. <laughs> so at some, some point somebody thought, yes, let, let's see what we can uh, do, do with the logs. And um, that's, a, that's a very early stage in producing a, a, a wooden shoe, just getting the very basic shape. <laughs> Using the knives, you get something a bit more shoe-like, but still solid, of course. More shapely, still solid. Somehow you need a hole to get your foot into that. And that's where these come in. Um, as essentially, they, they start making a hole with, with you can see the. I'll go back a bit. You can see the handle and there's a nice um, screw on that and you can screw it into the, into the block. I'm not sure, um, this, this is Mark C. N. That might have been the name of the, uh, the Sabo maker who owned it originally. But they tended to buy the, um, the metal tools without handles, I think, or they could buy them without handles, but because they were used to working with wood, they would then make their own handles. And uh, we've had all sorts of them and uh, the handles are all different. They're broadly the same purpose. Um, now, when I refer to an ice cream scoop, th this is the chisel they use for taking more wood out of the sabo. So nice big handle to give you plenty of grip. And, and then th this can be sharp, th this has gone a bit blunt, but this can be sharpened up to scoop out the wood. Um, in respect of handles, this, this obviously is a different approach. Same sort of chisel we know this one is German rather than French or Dutch. Um, people tend to forget that the Germans also wore wooden shoes of a wide range of styles and made them in exactly the same way that the French, the Belgians, the Dutch did. Essentially, if, if you look throughout Europe, 
they all had a way of producing solid wooden shoes uh, and in later years wooden shoes with leather uppers. Um, and we've got to just to run through a few more tools. Right, by, by the time you've got something you can get your tools inside, we, we've got more tools to get in there. Tools for scraping shavings out. Um, not got the handle on that one, but we, does that not have a handle on it? Huh. You see, there's a complicated variety of tools to, to make a fairly simple piece of footwear. And I think, uh, finally, um, to make it comfortable to put your feet inside, th this one's a rasp that will uh, go to the end of the, uh, the sabot. So uh, eventually, I've got them in the wrong order, yes. Uh, eventually you'll get something pretty well finished off. You can get, get the rasp inside it and um, you, you finally got a wearable sabot. I'll shift tools out of the way. So that's, that's roughly um, a, f a flying uh, look at how solid wooden European shoes are made. And in all honesty, despite what you can read on uh, the internet and Wikipedia to this day, that's not where the English clogs came from. Um, English clogs, as Vigen pointed out, she, I, I can't take the credit for the idea, she, she uh, researched this thoroughly in the 1970s. They evolved from an older style of footwear known as patterns. Um, and essentially they were pieces of wood that were strapped beneath the flimsy footwear that people tended to have. I mean, the, the sort of shoes and boots people had once upon a time, they were not much more than leather bags you would wear on your feet. And, and they must have been uncomfortable on road surfaces and probably not very waterproof. So going back many centuries in Britain and in European countries, the, the pattern was devised. To some extent, it was an update of footwear that was introduced by the Romans anyway. Um, in, in all honesty, the, early, the earliest wooden footwear in Britain dates back to the Romans and examples of wooden bath slippers um, from Roman times do survive. So we, we know that there was wooden footwear in, in Britain long before the Flemish weavers didn't come to Lancashire. Um, they did go to Norwich, by the way. Um, quite why they didn't invent clogs in Norwich, I'm not quite sure. Um, there was clog making in Norwich and uh, on, for some reason, nobody seems to say it was inspired by the Flemish weavers there. It's just, it's just become a Lancashire thing that we, we claim uh, foreign origins for something that uh, evolved locally. I'll just swivel round. This is a, a reproduction of a medieval pattern. Um, I think a few have survived, they've been found in archaeological digs, but um, fortunately there are a few paintings that uh, demonstrate that this, this is one of the styles that, that were worn um, going, going back a few hundred years. And you can see the principle is, is fairly simple. It's a simple carved sole. Um, it's reminiscent of a clog sole. It's got leather nailed onto it uh, and a, a leather lace and, and you would tie that over a delicate shoe and it would lift you out of mud, stones and water and protect your footwear. So those were around for um, quite some time in, in various guises, certainly hundreds of years and they predate the supposed arrival of Flemish weavers in Lancashire. Um, so by the time 
Flemish weavers came to this country full stop in, in the eastern counties. We, we'd already been making footwear like this for, for, for some time. So this, this is a very early stage of, of what became the clog. Years later, somebody decided it would be nice to, to raise the foot even higher out of the puddles. Um, you can see this is a, this is a modern mock-up of what's known as a, a ring pattern. Um, we've got some genuine ones. They're fairly uh, ancient and I, I tend not to um, take what I'd call museum quality exhibits to, to talks and it's probably uh, easier not digging them out to wave around uh, here today. But the, the main change here is that um, an iron ring, this, this, this is probably steel and it's got bolts, but uh, an iron ring is riveted through the wooden sole and it raises the wearer a few inches uh, above the surface. Some of these used to be quite tall. Th this is probably only four or five inches, well, perhaps three or four inches. But um, I think there are examples going up to 10 or 12 inches. Um, they must have been like stilt walkers. <laughs> uh, goodness knows how they coped with walking around on them. But um, th these were popular perhaps from the 17th century onwards, certainly throughout the 18th century. And surprisingly, um, they remained in popularity into the 19th century. I um, once read a costume book which claimed they died out in the 18th century. I found examples of them being um, advertised for sale in the late 19th century. Um, they, they were by, by then, they were probably a less popular style, but they still had a limited market. And when cloggers were advertised in trade directories as clog and pattern makers, it was for a reason. Um, they did carry on making patterns even when clogs came into existence. And this, this introduces the main elements of, of a clog. You've got a wooden sole, a bit of a leather upper, and you've got some iron below the sole. Taking it a stage further, um, this, this is just showing a, a clog sole with an iron attached, but obviously the people who could make these could make these. And researching individual um, clog and pattern makers, I, I have found examples of people who were describing themselves as pattern makers towards the end of the 18th century but by the 19th century had, had effectively converted over to being clog makers. In, in fact, um, clogs had been around for nearly 100 years by the time the 18th century came along. They, they started becoming available to a limited extent in a few places during the 17th century. Vidyan gives a few examples of, of ones that have survived and, and records that mention them. So at some point, somebody capable of making this decided it's going to be easier for the customer if they put a shoe or a boot upper on top of the sole, do away with the ring. Um, also, the iron comes along. I, I found examples, I'm still researching, but I think I found a family that moved from making pattern rings to making clog irons. The skills were, were very similar and um, they, essentially they, they adapted to the new market and, and started producing a new product. And I, I've just picked up a, an example, not, a, not an, a very ancient Lancashire clog, but this is what was typically seen to be the, the Lancashire clog, um, a fairly basic upper with very little stitching, just, just a, a few stitches 
on either side, uh, a clasp to fasten it, fairly um, square toe in this example, and, and as you can see, clog irons. Pe people, no doubt, they saw clogs like this and they could see the similarity to the European wooden shoes and assumed that these must have evolved from Sabo or Klompen or whatever you want to call them. Um, but the main similarity is that they're both designed to go over a foot, so they're going to be foot shaped. Uh, there's bound to be a similarity. And essentially, they serve the same sort of purpose. It, it seems to us that if people are faced with a problem all around the world of cold, wet, stony surfaces and the same availability of material and, and perhaps tools, eventually they'll, they'll come up with um, related solutions, but without necessarily being inspired by anybody else. Um, sometimes there was inspiration, sometimes people on opposite sides of the world came up with the, the same idea. And I'll, I'll just share uh, the screen again. This, was, this is um, another example of mechanization, by the way. Um, they look like clog soles, but here we are in France and it's um, a lady making galosh soles using machinery a very long time ago. So um, I'm assuming probably early 20th century, though I haven't got a, a, a precise date for it. I, th I think uh, it's been suggested it's around the time of the First World War, but uh, I'm not 100% certain. But you can see that um, in France, as well as producing the solid wooden sabot, they also had something that used soles very similar to our clog soles. I'll just whiz through the photographs. This, this is a photograph of a very old pattern. So you've seen my modern reproduction. Um, this, this is uh, essentially what they're based on. And this is proof that patterns lingered on far longer than um, people can imagine. This is from a clog catalog issued by the Lion Clog Works in Bolton in the early 1920s. Um, it's thanks to Phil Howard for providing this. Um, I, I'd only seen a later uh, catalog which didn't include the, the adverts for the patterns. But you can see the top one is pretty well like the reproduction medieval pattern that I was waving around earlier. Um, except it could have clog irons or strips of leather attached to the sole to stop the soles wearing out. And the pattern at the bottom, again, is um, very similar to the medieval one, but with the addition of a toe piece to stop your feet sliding forward out of them. And um, th these certainly survived into the period between the wars. Um, I think I'll go back to the meeting i'll just produce one example of how the patterns of hundreds of years ago have survived to the present you see a massive wooden sole and um, a leather back and straps that is designed to be worn over a boot in an industrial workplace. Um, no, no irons or rubbers on the sole. You wouldn't do much walking in these, but if you were wearing them in a, a foundry, a steelworks, possibly a glassworks, going back to when there were such things, uh, gasworks, then this is the sort of thing that was available and you might not see the label. I'll, I'll try to show the label. Oops. 
Um, anyway, they're made by Walkley's in Mylmroyd. They're not in their online catalogue, but there's a, there's a cryptic clue on the website that says safety clogs are available to order. And um, essentially it was producing this sort of thing. Um, they're generally referred to as overclogs rather than patterns, but it's exactly the same principle as patterns. And um, th they've carried on being available into modern times, even, even though you, you'll rarely see them. Th there'll be some people wearing them to work and they'll, they'll save their feet from an industrial accident. Um, so well worth the money. Um, it's the sort of job you wouldn't want to go to wearing a pair of trainers. I think uh, these would do the trick. And a much smaller one, I nearly forgot it. This is um, very reminiscent of the ones in the, the Line Clogworks catalogue. We're not 100% certain um, where this was made. You can see it's got the tie on the top. Um, I think it looks like strips of leather nailed to the bottom, but the pattern in the leather on the tie is very reminiscent of um, le leather attached to French clogs that we've got. There's a, there's a possibility that either these were made in France or somehow an English clogger had a supply of French um, leather for uh, making them, but um, very difficult to date, unfortunately. And these things, clogs in general, patterns in general, um, limited numbers have survived to the present. It's, it's very hard to find something that you know is genuinely old because when they get a bit worn, unless there's some sentimental attachment to them, they go on the fire. And um, I mean, fortunately in this country, children's clogs often have been handed down the generations. Um, some, somebody might very well have great great grandmother's clogs as, as a baby that have been passed on and they're treasured in the family. They'll always be passed on to the next generation. Um, and, and then eventually with the look, I'll end up with them. But uh, <laughs> The some to, they, are, they are passed on, but many, many clogs, um, particularly scruffy work clogs, they're the sort of thing, they'll, they'll just go on the fire. And it's the same in Europe. It's very hard finding um, what you would call a, a genuinely old pair of Dutch klompen, because the solid wood, much of the time, they don't have anything on the sole to stop them wearing out. When the sole starts wearing through, they're used as firewood and they'll, they'll have a new pair. So it's, it's a great shame that so much has been lost. So we just need to treasure the ones that we do have. Now, I think I've got another couple of slides. On the subject of differences between British clogs and European clogs, uh, over the years, um, our knowledge has evolved. We, we tended to think initially um, at least British clogs are more comfortable because we have leather uppers to them, unlike the Europeans who have, have these dreadfully uncomfortable solid wooden ones. And, and then we find out um, the Europeans were familiar with leather as well. It's um, not all that radical a technology after all. This, this is um, a French example uh, of a, a boot upper clog. Obviously in Britain, there are quite a variety of, of clogs with boot uppers. This is one that fastened both with laces and, and a strap and buckle um, in, a, in a child size. And it came to us unused, nothing on the sole, and it left us with a, we've still got the tendency to think, oh, well, okay, they use uh, clogs with wooden soles and leather uppers, but at least we had the sense to put irons or rubbers on ours. And 
I'll find my last couple of slides. Right, well, here we have a French advertisement for clog irons. Uh, and if you look carefully, they're pretty well identical to clog irons we would expect to find on a British clog. Um, you can see even down to the extent of the double headed clog iron nails being exactly the same as, as ones that we would use. Um, and, and these are advertised as um, being suitable for sabots or galoshes. Uh, the galoshes being the clogs with the leather uppers. Sabots are substantially uh, all wood, but use a certain amount of uh, leather. Now, it, it's hard to know whether there has been any influence between Britain and France in, in the French adopting clog irons. Um, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that one or whether it's been a case of, we, we've all got the same problem. We want to stop the wood wearing out. So we find something to attach to the soles and um, irons are a suitable, uh, a suitable means of stopping them wearing out, as well as irons. This, this one I, is, I think, a free advertising cover to go on school books. And this one is advertising what we call rubbers, rubber irons, um, again, to be attached to galoshes. And it shows a um, pointy toe and round toe version of, of the rubbers. So yes, essentially, the French have clogs with wooden soles, leather uppers and irons or rubbers. Uh, in other words, exactly the same as we've got. And whether we influence them or they influenced us, I'm not quite sure anybody knows. I'll, I'll probably rattle through and wave a few um, clogs around to illustrate the points now. Th this is a, a, a different example of a French sab. I think, yeah, French? Yeah, French. French, yes, ni nicely decorated sabot, uh, a bit of uh, carving in the wood. It's got some leather attached to it to, to provide a bit of comfort and a bit more grip as you put your foot in. But you can see um, it's got a full set of rubbers on the sole. And um, curiously, we found available in France for sabots and galoshes, wood milne rubbers Wood Mill being an early rubber company in Leyland, Lancashire, that for some reason devised rubbers for French sabots. Uh, and I'm assuming originally they made them in Leyland and, and sold them over there. At some point, I think somebody in France seems to have taken up the franchise and carried on making them in France under the Wood Mill name. Um, but th they were still embossed with the Woodmill name many years later. So um, we we've perhaps had a little influence over the French um, that we can take credit for. We, we did find uh, another brand available as well in, in France, but I, I must admit, I I'm not a, a great linguist. So I haven't been spending a great deal of time doing French research, but we, ju we just come across interesting facts every now and then. Would you believe the dogs come pestering me for her tea? <laughs> ah. So earlier on, I should have waved this around. Uh, I, I explained how uh, the modern way of doing the solid wooden shoe is to shove a block of wood in a copying lathe. And uh, that, that's a, a, a substantially completed example of the sort of thing they do. That, that would have been a block of wood clamped into the copying lathe, somebody pressed go, all the blades whizzed around it, and, and then shortly afterwards it, it produced this uh, and it just needs a bit of finishing off and take off that end. But it's, it's a, a nice example of the modern way of doing it, but an early stage. I've, I've pointed out the, fr the French have leather 
bogs similar to ours. Going back a few years, we were at an event with Phil Howard and uh, we were playing a game of uh, Guess the Clogger with some of our collection. And um, Phil had a look at, uh, at this pair. Um, let's have a look. Nice tan leather upper, neat wooden sole, nails not too fancy, um, complete rubber sole. You'd say it's a, a Gibson upper, Spanish. Um, pretty well identical to what we would think of as a, a typical British clog, but um, made in Spain. Did they copy us? Who knows? Um, they've produced them for a long time and they regard them as uh, traditional, but um, it could be a case of people separated by hundreds or thousands of miles coming up with the same idea. An extreme example of how people th thousands of miles apart come up with the same sort of idea. Uh, this is another traditional Spanish style. This one is solid wood. Um, again, nice upper. It's got three feet to lift it above the ground. Um, the, these are usually found with a wooden tripod. They're sometimes found with uh, rubber attached to the feet. And um, I've got a full size pair bought directly from a maker in Spain, which I, I have sometimes worn for talks as a, an example of, of the strange things you can get. Uh, and it has cut up tractor tires attached to the, the three feet. So that's, that's um, well, it's, it's a good example of recycling, I would say. And it, it's something that's known in this country as well. The number of times I, I've been talking to people about clogs and they said, well, yes, dad used to have clogs. And when the irons wore out, if he couldn't get more irons, he'd cut up bicycle tires or car tires. So, so in, in this country, people have reused whatever rubber they could find if they didn't have easy access to, to proper irons or rubbers or, or just wanted to save a few shillings. So um, the, the principle is there. But anyway, that, that's an example of how in Western Europe, somebody came up with the idea of a solid wooden shoe on feet to lift you out of the puddles. Very similar principle to this, again, solid wood, um, just two feet, career. Now, it's hard to imagine an origin story that somehow connects people making wooden shoes in Spain and people making wooden shoes in Korea. Not impossible. I mean, we, we do know that we traded with the entire world and we colonised a lot of it. Bits we didn't colonise, we, we exchanged products. But on the face of it, it's more likely to be an example that people in Korea, people in Spain had the same problems. They wanted to keep the feet dry. They had the same material, wood, and, and came up with a similar solution. Um, going a little bit further east. Everybody's probably familiar with these um, Japanese gator shoes. These are very simple. This is quite a, quite a, a modern pair. Um, holds onto the feet fairly easily. In, in, in fact, we, we've not dug them out, but you could get special socks with the big toe separated from the other toes so that you can get that between your toes. Um, but that, that's an example of the solution that the Japanese came up with, um, keeping feet dry, raise the feet above a, a wet surface. People sometimes confuse these with the Japanese gator. It's the same sort of principle, different approach, a bit fancier, a bit of nice tooling. That's, that's another one where you, you have to shove that between your toes to hold it into place. 
I, th I think um, as, as far as wooden shoes go, I wouldn't be too keen on wearing these. Um, so I'll leave that to, to, to the natives. And these came from India. So uh, again, don't know who inspired them, but uh, same problem. Um, not too far from India, Afghanistan. Again, bit, the, these are a bit rough and ready. Not really made for the tourists. I'm not quite sure how they um, came our way, but uh, that's the uh, other far, well, that's the, the, the other way of uh, protecting the, uh, the wearer from the rain. Um, I'm assuming that they probably went round the back of the heel to uh, keep them in place, so possibly slightly more comfy than the Indian ones. I think I'll just show you one or two more European examples, and, and then it might be the, uh, the point to pause for breath and see whether any questions have arisen. Oh. Not quite in Europe yet. An another style that you might be familiar with, um, ni nice uh, mother of pearl. Again, these are designed for uh, use in bathhouses and these are Turkish nailing. There are very, there are very um, simple ones you can get for use in real bathhouses. I, th I think um, the, fa the fancier ones didn't get much day-to-day -day use, but um, you can buy very plain ones to this day, if by any chance you can go on holiday to somewhere like Istanbul. Uh, I'm, I'm told the, uh, there is a store there in the central bazaar that sells them and I tried to persuade a work colleague to buy me a pair once when he went on holiday there but somehow it slipped his mind and he came home without them. Um, whoops. <laughs> ah, yes, J Janet's giving me a modern day example of, of that sort of thing. I think were these Greek? No, these are Turkish for well, nailing. Oh, well, they're nailing. We, yeah. got, we have a Greek pair somewhere, but uh, yes, this, this is a modern day version of the nailing. And, and this does involve uh, a bit of rubber to stop slipping on the wet floor. Um, and an another example of a clog lift to lift the wearer um, out of the water, you, you can see as well as the heel, this, this has a bit of a ridge below the sole. And I will say that those are German. So that is one example of the style of shoe made in Germany. Use a bit of padded leather to, to make them more comfortable. Perhaps one last comparison between a German style of clog and a British equivalent. And it's probably a rare example of uh, genuine European influence over British clog making. That's a, a German two buckle clog. Um, un unfortunately, it's, it's lost one of its buckles, but um, essentially it has a, a little flap and a couple of buckles rather than uh, laces. And I've, I've not found clog irons or rubbers in German clogs yet, but they, they did like hobnails. So arguably uh, a main difference between German and British clogs is the, the use of hobnails and the, a tendency, they, they like brown leather, whereas a lot of our old clogs were only ever in black leather. I, th I think once upon a time you could have any colour you liked as long as it was black. Oops. You'll see this one looks very similar. Uh, this is an English two buckle clog. Um, 
we think I think this one dates from the 1950s. It's it was actually a retirement gift for somebody when he left a colliery. Um, and this has got irons rather than hobnails, and it's in black leather. But otherwise, the style is pretty well the same as the um, the German clog. And we think the reason for that is. In the late 19th century, we actually started importing the two buckle clog, or at the time we called it the Baltic clog, from Germany. Um, I found records of um, German made clogs on sale, particularly in um, British coastal towns, mainly England and Scotland, but in, in some other towns and as far as the Isle of Man. And I think in the early days, they were nearly all imports. Um, in later days, English cloggers carried on making them. And we dropped the Baltic name probably around the time of the First World War, when anything remotely Germanic became very unfashionable. Um, so these became the two buckle clog, sometimes the gardening clog um, is what they were aimed at. And it, it does seem a real example of how European clogs influenced um, British clogs in this case. Now, I did notice uh, a question flashed up, and do I need to look at it again? Oh, yes. Yeah, so what about the clog boots worn in Billingsgate Fish Market before they took to, uh, to gum boots? Um, Oh, just a second. Um, I'm, I'm quite quite familiar with um, clog wearing in London. People don't tend to associate London with clog wearing, but um, there was a business I saw referred to in London that was established as clog makers in the 18th century, and they carried on in the trade for um, many generations afterwards. Um, ha having spotted them, I do need to do more research on that particular business. But I'm, I'm aware that there, there was one last clog maker in London, I think, into the 1970s, mainly producing industrial clogs. Um, haven't seen much about them, other than Frank Walkley referred to them as one of his competitors in his uh, autobiography. Um, and, and eventually he drove them out of business in his um, drive to become the monopoly supplier of clogs for industry. So, so certainly um, boot clogs were, were popular in London. Um, there were various designs. I think um, in the fish market, possibly something like a flap and buckle clog would have been popular just in case um, you ended up dropping any fish bits and they uh, ended up in your uh, laces. Um, I, I've probably got examples to, uh, to hand, to be honest, but some of them are inaccessible um, on the shelves behind me. Any more questions yet or? Yes, so feel free to put your questions in the chat or, or put your hand up or just unmute yourself and ask a question. The origins of the clasp, yes. I've been doing some research, Simon, on John Watts Limited of Sheffield, who effectively became the monopoly supplier of clasps by the end of the 19th century. Um, that business traces its roots back to 1765, if I remember correctly. And um, I think it was said to be founded by Michael Bates in 1765 in uh, West Bar in Sheffield. And then I think it passed to John Bates. Um, and then it ended up in the, oh, not, not Bates. I, I'm thinking of Brian Bates. The, the, it was uh, Michael Shaw, John Shaw, uh, Brian Bates's parents-in-law. And then Brian Bates ended up in partnership with John Watts until Brian Bates toddled off and opened a hotel in Buxton instead. Um, we think probably mid 18th century as, as, as 
an origin of the class might be uh, useful, but um, might be plausible, but qu quite why they opted for uh, clasps rather than uh, any other fasting at that time, I don't know. Um, it did mean they were easy to slip on and off. And um, in some situations, if say you were wearing a, a clasp clog down a coal mine and you got your foot stuff stuck in a, a, a fall of the, uh, the seam, you could at least uh, quickly um, slip the clog off if you could uh, release the clasp. So, but quite who came up with the idea, it's one of these things we probably don't know the real origin other than they have been around for an eternity. They were largely associated with Lancashire clogs. And um, as time went on, other styles um, came to uh, came to come into use. Uh, I've had a note um, passed to me by my uh, helpful assistant who uh, reminds me that um, clasps were used to fasten medieval books together and also on certain types of shoes from the Middle Ages onwards. So it may be that they inspired the use uh, for clog clasps. And I need to open uh, chat for a sec. Just scroll back up the list. Were clogs high status or low status footwear? Um, the word clog has been applied to different sorts of footwear over the uh, centuries. Once upon a time, there was a, a type of footwear which essentially was really uh, a fancy pattern. And um, it could be covered in leather or embroidered material and so on, and only be used by um, the social elite of the country to, to keep their fancy shoes clean. But in later years, when road surfaces became better, there were pavements and so on, the upper classes didn't need that type of clog. Essentially, you ended up with uh, clogs that were really aimed only at the working classes. And they, they were a low status footwear, perhaps looked a bit shabby in some cases, uh, lasted for cheap, lasted forever if you got the irons replaced. And as years went by, clogs tended to become associated with poverty and being old fashioned. People, people, when they got more money and could afford shoes that were essentially disposable, um, turned to shoes rather than to clogs. Um, I mean, Janice has just suggested to me that with nailing, there was a, a, the Turkish style of, of, of uh, bath shoe. There was a distinction between the high ones, which would be learned, worn by the elite people, and the lower ones, which would be worn by the servants. So um, the height of uh, your wooden footwear was one way of demonstrating your status. It's a bit like perhaps um, having a, a higher top hat than anybody else. Um, now, yes, there's a comment about uh, clogs in the chemical industry with thick soles. Uh, the bottom could char on very hot surfaces and act as uh, insulation. Uh, I mean, I've shown the overclogs, which um, could be used in a situation like that. But um, there were clogs with various boot uppers that you, you wouldn't need to wear over anything else. And they could have much thicker wooden soles than you would see on the day-to-day -day clogs. Thicker wooden soles than uh, clog dancers would ever want, uh, unless they wanted to do a comedy turn. I'm scrolling down. Uh, yes, a suggestion that uh, dancers out and about in London in their clogs still come across people who wore clogs uh, back in the 1950s. Um, The clogs being more comfortable than the, uh, the the industrial steel boots that they were offered by the business. I'm scrolling down. Ah, that's an interesting comment. The the workers who had their own clogs available um, would, and this is in London, I, I, if I understand the context correctly, at the Christmas party, they. Um, could be persuaded to do clog dances on the tables. So um, 
I, I've definitely come across that. In the 19th century, I've seen references to market porters um, taking a break and, and having step dancing competitions, some in clogs, some in shoes. So clog dancing, clogs, not exclusive to the north of England, found all over Britain. Um, I think pretty well every last part of Britain, but um, just to a much greater extent than in, um, in in Lancashire and the north and anywhere else. Why do American clog dancers not wear actual clogs? Did they ever? Yes, de they definitely did wear clogs. Um, it's it's a bit of a tricky subject in some respects. Um, the clog dancers in America were often associated with minstrel troops throughout the 19th century. And um, a lot of the time, inevitably wore blackface. And it's part of clog dancing's history that we'd probably prefer to forget in some respects. Um, the use of clogs eventually went out of uh, popularity probably by the end of the, uh, the 19th century. And they started to wear shoes instead, whether doing sand dances or the style of dances that evolved into tap dancing. There were shoes available that you could have strips of hard wood nailed to them as an alternative to wearing clogs. And the um, Lion Clog Works catalog that um, Phil kindly provided recently on one of the pages where they're advertising their dancing clogs they said you could go to the clog works with your own leather shoes and have strips of hard wood nailed to the soles of your leather shoes um, so that they were dance shoes. So, so there was um, a period in, in both countries, uh, in, in the States and uh, in Britain, where clog dancing evolved into different styles. It carried on to some extent in Britain, but as, as a lifestyle, I don't know, I assume it completely died out in the States and um, went along different routes into tap dancing and Appalachian dancing. Let's have a look. Ah, a suggestion. Um, one viewer went to an Appalachian dance festival in 1990 and some of the older ladies wore clog boots with laces up to their knees. So I would have loved to have witnessed that, but um, I must admit at the minute, I, I'm not um, doing a lot of research on what was going on in the States. Um, when Americans came to Britain or there was an interplay between the two countries, I'm of interest. I have found um, in the Library of Congress, an old manual of clog dancing, which I think on the back page or towards the end of the manual, there is an advert for dancing clogs. This is in the early 1870s. They were advertising dancing clogs in the United States and they said they imported the latest styles from England. So clearly some English cloggers were providing clogs to American dancers. Um, it's likely that there were also American clog makers. In fact, I, I say likely, it's definite because I've also found examples of British retailers in the 19th century importing clogs from the United States. Um, at the minute, I have the faintest idea why. When we had so many clog makers in Britain producing everything under the sun, you would have thought, why would we import clogs from the USA? Um, unless somebody negotiated a really good trade deal. As no doubt we'll have soon. Um, but they did do, and I don't know, perhaps um, the Americans had uppers with laces and that was when they were introduced. It, it's, at, at the minute, it's on the back burner. It's something I'm going to think about and if I can get to the bottom of it, I, I will do. But clearly um, there was a reason for importing clogs from the States. We did import clogs from other European countries. Um, that makes pinning the origin of clogs uh, down a little difficult because um, people confuse this notion of um, our clogs having evolved from Sabo, but there were Sabo in this country. We imported them. Um, 
there were parts of the country that were quite popular. Perhaps um, they, were, they might have been cheaper than clogs with the leather uppers. People might have bought them for their farm workers or other workers. Um, at, at intervals during the 19th century, well-meaning, uh, probably middle and upper class people had little debates along the lines of, um, the, the people in this part of the country are ill because they're wearing poor quality boots, they've got cold wet feet, and wouldn't it be better if they wore something that was better at keeping their feet warm and dry? And then the debate is, should they opt for the Lancashire clog or should they opt for sabots? And, and there was talk of buying in sabots for use in workhouses and the like. So to some extent, there were sabots in this country. It's possible that the pair that at one point was at Rivington before it ended up on the fire um, had come from that sort of source. It might have just been imported in the late 18th or early 19th century and somebody saw a shabby pair and thought it had been around for hundreds of years um, rather, rather than uh, being much more recent. We, we did have people in this country advertising availability of French clogs. The trouble is they weren't really very specific what they meant by French clogs. Um, they might have meant sabot, they might have meant some style of galosh. One sort of galosh um, was an obvious alternative to the Lancashire clog because it had um, a leather upper and they lacquered the upper, so the leather was rock solid. Um, but no giving, giving them, you didn't really um, tie them on, but you could slip them on and off very easily if you wanted something on your feet to nip out into the yard to hang up the washing. And um, it, it is quite possible that they were available. Um, again, I'm going through the references and might get to the bottom of that at some point, but um, it's, it's a long process. Um, doing this. I, I dip in and out of things as they interest me and um, sometimes things get put to one side because something else has cropped up which seems a bit more urgent. Um, oh I've had an, a question about can I can somebody send me a donation to pass on rather than set up an account? Um, probably if you can track me down, uh, perhaps look for me on Facebook and uh, send me a message and we can discuss it. <clears throat> Just a second, I need a mouthful of water. Where do skulls fit in? Um, I'm not entirely certain how far they date back. Um, I remember Frank Walker in his autobiography was very dismissive of them because um, one of his rivals was uh, knocking out the, the soles for skull clogs on copying lathes and I have a feeling he thought he should have had the contract to do those. Um, but obviously um, perhaps slight, uh, slightly European or Scandinavian in style but um, they're fairly basic and uh, uh, just a minute have we got... <laughs> yes um, I, I've already waved around an example of a, a, a wooden sandal type shoe which was was probably the the inspiration for the skulls I've got a, a question when I lived in Scotland as I lad I wore clogs were these Lancashire clogs the British style of clog um, it, was, it probably became universal at one point, though to some extent there were probably regional styles that, that spread around as, as clog makers move around the country. Um, I mean, for instance, I found clog makers from Lancashire did move all over the place. Um, I found a clog maker from Wigan who moved to Hampshire and he advertised that he made clogs and cricket bats, um, related skills you might think. Um, the ones in Scotland, I don't know whether specifically any Lancastrians went up that way, but there were clog makers in Westmoreland and Cumberland, and it's only a short hop over the border from Cumberland into Scotland. 
I found um, the reverse has happened. I referred to the, the Lion Clogworks catalog, which I recently made available thanks to Phil in a few Facebook groups. And um, in the 19, from the 1920s onwards, that Clogworks was run by a chap called James Rogan. James Rogan, though he was working in Bolton, he was born in the Glasgow area. Um, he sometimes said in the census he was born in Glasgow, but one of them says uh, he, bought, he was born in a place that um, initially was outside of Glasgow and ended up as a suburb. Um, Rogan moved from Glasgow to London and he worked as a clog maker in London. And then for some reason on his way to London, he passed through Lancashire and got married. Um, went with his wife to London, started a family there, then moved back to Bolton where no doubt they were nearer her family. And um, I think initially he was employed by a master clogger, but eventually he took on the Lion Clog Works. And he has all sorts of uh, strange styles in the catalogue. And I wonder whether there are any Scottish or London influences in, in the range he offered. Um, or whether they were all Lancastrian styles. Um, there's a question, was there a specific Lancashire style? We, we tend to think of the clasp clog as being the classic Lancashire style. If, if anybody thinks of a Lancashire clog, they, they mainly think of that. But other styles were available in Lancashire. Um, gradually lace up styles, um, strap and button, strap and buckle styles. Um, I think most cloggers had a, a fairly broad range after a while. Simon is uh, mentioning uh, about timber, but that's uh, a fairly typical question when I uh, do talks. People are, are, are always interested in what sort of wood was used. Um, alder was uh, definitely popular, as uh, Simon says. Beach in um, machine-made soles and sycamore nowadays um, there used to be a clog sole factory in Bootle and they advertised for availability of timber they placed adverts in Ireland they wanted to buy stocks of timber from Ireland and they'd buy almost anything to be honest if it was big enough to cut up into blocks to use for clog soles they would use it I've seen examples of willow and poplar being used um, We've got a pair of clogs where the soles are mismatched. They're industrial clogs, which were not really intended for Sunday best or to last. Um, and I think the, the, the left foot has got one uh, sort of wood and the right foot has got another sort of wood. And one of them might even be oak. It's just hard to tell. But uh, I'm being told to wrap up now, which is fair enough because <coughs> my voice is going a bit. <laughs> It was a question, Michael. Did we have any final questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll wrap up. <laughs> um, right, so what have we been past here? That's a different style. Of oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, ju just uh, a last look at a, a different style of, of clog. Um, we, th these have become fairly obscure nowadays. Um, it, it's the Derby shoe with uh, strap and buckle, uh, which um, it's, it's a bit like the ordinary strap and buckle clog popular uh, with, with women in particular, but it has a, has a tongue rather than a cutout. So it's obviously more waterproof um, on a wet day, where, whereas the, the typical strap and buckle clog, you'd end up with a wet sock half the time in this country. Um, I'm not sure why these are, are, are not more popular. I could imagine um, those would be suitable for either clog or Morris dancing. Um, uh, and yes, and for sure, they were known as the de shoe. So get on to Phil or Simon or your clogger of choice and ask whether uh, they can make you a pair of de shoes. These were little miniature clogs. Uh, they were given away at uh, a scout jamboree in uh, in Holland, and they were all po poker work. So oh, excellent. There's a little use for them. Uh, yeah, I've seen talk about Scottish clogs. Uh, 
many years ago, I saw a, a pair of clogs in the uh, East Five Folk Museum. Um, I took a photo at the time, but it, it was all blurred. Cameras were, you know, it could have been 30 years ago. And finally, is it true that you don't get cones with clogs? Um, there are all sorts of stories about how good they are for your feet. I think in theory, if you wear nothing but clogs, because the soles don't bend, the uppers don't rub your feet. Um, so, you know, through to old age, you should have perfect baby feet. But um, the, the trouble is that there are, there are so few of us who can wear clogs all day long in all circumstances. So uh, um, if you end up with corns, it's probably because of the days you were wearing your shoes rather than your clogs. Right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, quick question. Hello. And then Susan, yes. Hi. Um, I'm from Rainbow Morris in Saltaire. So we do Northwest dancing. So we wear clogs. But as we're getting older, we find them quite uncomfortable because they weren't made for our feet. So we are allowed now to buy the um, Clark's lace up shoes. Can, is it possible to have irons put onto those ordinary shoes or not? I think you might get away with put. To, uh, have you heard of something called Blakely Segs? Yes. Um, Skeggies, you might, yeah. You might find you can yeah. attach segs to ordinary shoes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, if, if you struggle to get anywhere to buy them, I'm pretty sure they sell them on eBay. Somebody's bound to have segs for sale. And, and you just nail them into the soles. But you so need what's to... it called again? Sorry, Blakely Sex S. S E double -G, -G, G S, I yep. think. Is it yeah. double single G? One G. Yeah. One G. Yeah. If if I can add a add a comment, um, the other half of Seven Champions, um, the ladies team that are now associated with them, are dancing in boots with hobnails on them with rubber soles so that it's obviously possible right okay the other solution i would say is is get the silver thane insoles and put them inside your clogs mm. yeah i can definitely speak out in favor of silver thane insoles uh <laughs> 20 odd years ago i uh applied to the preston sports council for a grant to buy them for royal lancashire morris dancers um, the, the team I was in at the time, and um, they they gave us a grant to buy one pair of insoles, uh, one pair of Sorbethane anti-shock insoles per dancer, I think the musicians as well probably, and then the company that made them was the Leyland and Birmingham Rubber Company, based in Leyland at the time, and I approached the company and said, we've got a grant enough to buy one pair of uh, insoles per m person, um, could we have two pairs for the same amount of money, please? But we'll do a publicity thing with you for the local paper. And uh, it, it worked. We got two pairs of insoles uh, per man, <laughs> one for the irons, one for the rubbers. And um, we, we went in costume to the Leyland and Birmingham Rubber Company and the paper turned up and photographed us with their uh, marketing manager. So we did quite well out of that. Now, the Sorbethane insoles, they're, they're fairly thin. Um, and one of the men said, uh, I'm not sure I've got to get any benefit from these and uh, had a bit of a moan about it. And then after one week when he left them out, he said, I can tell the difference now dancing without them. So, yeah, that, that's a tip. Anti-shock insoles, definitely a, a good uh, 21st century thing to do. Weren't well, well, Leyland actually sponsored by, by Silver there at one point? Yes, yes, they were. Yeah. That's quite correct. <laughs> Oh, that, well, that I didn't know, but we, we muscled in and managed to uh, <laughs> get, a, get a bit of a freebie from the company. The trouble is, they're, uh, I think they're made in China nowadays, and I'm not con convinced they're quite as good as they used to be. Yeah, so there's no factory now, is there? No. It's a housing estate where the factory was. Yeah. Well, I, I'm hitting the point that I'm going to, I want to go and watch the rugby on plus an hour, because. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. And um, in a second, I'll ask you all to unmute and give them a round of applause. But just to remind her that if you've enjoyed the talk uh, and you've got a few spare quid, you can bob it to Michael's chosen charity, which is Eftus. Um, okay, so if people would like to unmute themselves 
and give Michael a round of applause. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> well done, Michael. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah. It's been yeah, well nice, done. nice seeing everybody again. Nice Thank seeing you, Michael. Michael. Thank you, 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 Michael. Th